That's interesting. Tom, can Tom Oxley, could you please make me a co host? <laughs> I seem to have lost my co hostness. Okay. Oh and we're showing up on YouTube starting now, so that's up. Um, I don't see that I'm co-host either, so that I can do some waiting room things. It okay. says so on mine, Terry. It does it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It does it yeah. on mine as well. It does on mine. Okay. Well, good. Hello. Oh, Terry, um, I don't have set up the waiting room yet because I don't want to have people come out of the waiting room. I will do that when we're further along so that you can put Steve there later. I think I'm okay now. I was checking controls. I don't know if I had a lag, but I can now do things I couldn't do before. Okay. I hope that doesn't sound too ominous. <laughs> Larry, you're set up. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Good. Hi, John. All right. There's Julia. Good. Mary. Okay, Gidget, add Brad, Brad Nevin, N-E-A-V-I-N. I'm sending him the link right now. Okay. Tom and Gidget are helping us uh, do the role today, just making sure they see everybody who's, who's in, the, uh, in the Zoom meeting so that you will be listed as being present. Um, John Mondler, if you could please um, put your, uh, write out your full name, rename yourself with your last name as well. There's Rosemary, hi. Hello, Larry. And Diane, great. Hi. Hi, Diane. Hi, how are you? Hi, Diane. Good to see everybody. Good to see right. you. Thank you. And we are officially on a second screen. <laughs> I think so. Hi. Hi, Mike. There's John Neely. Very nice. Good morning, all. Hey. Hello. And Aaron, if you could put your last name down as well, thanks. And Brian, too. Oh, folks are coming on like wildfire now. This is great. <laughs> Nancy? Nancy at the beach, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to see myself, oh, I can't talk. I have to see myself on Zoom so much. I'd like to see me where I wanna be. There you go, go with that. Easy. <laughs> hey, Angie. Good morning, Marge. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yo, morning, Brian. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. Hi. Okay. If everybody would mute themselves, good morning. It is essentially 10 o'clock. And I am welcoming all of you to this call stated meeting of the Miami, of the Presbytery of the Miami Valley. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bright sunshine today. We thank you for allowing us to come together in a different way, but where we see each other and can speak to each other and can feel like we are all together as one. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of your big plan for this world. We ask that you guide us as we meet today, be with us as we go about our business. Thank you this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, um, I now recognize the stated clerk for some preliminary matters. Thank you, moderator. And I'm going to now mute everybody. And that may be you as well, moderator. So make sure the next time you talk that you are unmuted. Okay. Okay, so I think everybody is muted now. I declare that a quorum that is required by our bylaws for a special meeting like this is present. And I announce that the role for today's meeting will be formed by names that were entered initially at the advance registration for this meeting and confirmed by two people who were present today. They're doing visual observation of those who are actually attending this Zoom meeting. This meeting was properly called under our bylaws by notice that was issued on July 30th, 2020. And by our rules, only the matters that are listed on the docket on page two of that notice may be transacted at this meeting. But I wanna give you a heads up that there has been a recent change in our docket for today. Late last week, the Collinsville Church asked that we not proceed with presbytery approval of the covenant of gracious separation in order that the church have more time to resolve some local issues with their township that have nothing to do with the covenant itself. These are matters between the church and the township where it lies. So the administrative commission for the Collinsville church that had requested that we do some docket items related to that church today have now asked that the presbytery defer action on motions four and five until a later undetermined date. So in a few minutes, when I move approval of the revised docket, that docket will consist only of the items from the Committee on Preparation for Ministry, which are motions one, two, and three. Now, before we begin, even though most of you are veterans of doing presbytery meetings by Zoom, there are always a few people who are new to our work. And so I'm just gonna take just a couple of minutes to make sure that everybody knows how to do the three essential functions that you need to know how to do to participate in today's meeting. The first thing you need to know how to do is to unmute yourself. You're all muted right now for for, so we don't have a lot of background noise, but I want you to practice unmuting yourself using whatever device that you have. Just unmute yourself. You should see maybe a <coughs> microphone with a line through it or some other way. I'm seeing on that screen, most of you are well unmuted. Let me go to the second screen, looking good. Okay. Uh, Joe, are you okay to unmute? You're okay, right? Okay, right. Joe yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm gonna um, mute you all back up. Um, we're gonna be using your unmute function if you are recognized by the moderator to speak. And I'm gonna ask you when you unmute yourself, having been recognized, that you do a couple of things automatically, that you give your name, whether you're a ruling elder or a minister of the word and sacrament. If you're a ruling elder, what church you're connected with, or if you're a minister with a particular church that you mention that, or mention that you're honorably retired, whatever your status is, so that all of us know who you are when you begin to speak each time that you do that. The second thing you need to know how to do is to be recognized to speak. Now, um, the way you do that 
is not to raise your hand in your own little viewing, uh, viewing space, but to use the raise hand symbol that's on your device. For most of you who are on computers, that'll be in the participants tab in your taskbar. For those on other devices, look around your toolbar for a raised hand. That's a thing with a palm open. It's not a thumbs up. It's not a wave. It's a raised hand. Yeah, Diane, you have the wave. So you're going to be looking for something else that's a raised hand. That's going to be the symbol we use. I'm going to scroll down here and look through my, my uh, participants tab. Keep that up there. Don't move it. Keep your raised hand up so I'm sure that everybody has a chance to be recognized by a raised hand. Quite a few people are still searching for that apparently. Under your participants tab, there should be, might be a blue hand, might be another color, but let's look for that. I'm still seeing a lot of people who are not raising their hands. Frank, Diane, you're still searching? Okay. Okay, that's the best you can do, Diane. We'll try to work with that. Okay, not a problem. Most of you have found it. Um, obviously, we're gonna be flexible here. If it comes time to be recognized and you simply cannot find that, you're gonna to need to unmute yourself, get our attention, and let us know what's going on. But most of you, I hope, can find that blue hand to be recognized by the moderator to speak. All right, I'm gonna clear all of those hands away. There we go. Now, the third thing you need to do, and this is really important, um, you need to find how to vote, yes or no. And I'm gonna emphasize this because at our last meeting, we discovered that there were quite a few people, quite a bit, quite a lot of people who were actually not voting, who were present in the meeting. And I'm concerned about that, that maybe you all couldn't find your yes or no uh, buttons there on your device. So we need to find somewhere on your device, a yes and no button that'll allow you to vote. For those of you on computers, again, go to your participants tab and it should be right there for you to vote yes or no. So please go there now and vote either yes or no and keep it up there so I can make sure that you voted. Either yes or no is fine. And we're gonna work with anybody who we find out uh, does not is not voting to find out what the issue may be because I don't want folks not voting here. Please find that quickly and vote. It may be for those of you who are on uh, ele other electronic devices, not computers, it may be under a more tab or under a couple of dots. You're gonna find your yes or no button, but that's really important. Um, William Cash, I'm seeing that you are not registering a vote. Randall Brakemeyer also. I'm gonna ask that one thing we're going to do here is we can't spend a ton of time with each individual person working this out. Lynn Bova is in the chat function. And so if you have problems, chat with Lynn Bova in the chat function, just, just chat to everybody, and she will help you try to find that in your, um, on your particular device. Um, when we reach the actual voting, if there is anyone that is not on my screen and is not voting, I am going to then ask you for your vote orally so that everyone has a chance to vote, okay? Uh, now I'm going, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna clear all the votes and any of you still having problems either with a raise hand or the vote function, please contact Lynn Bova in the chat function. All right. Now we're going to start to vote. And I'm gonna offer the first motion that will involve a vote. It's gonna be a unanimous consent request and the moderator will describe 
how this works in terms of your voting. So moderator, I ask that by unanimous consent, the Presbytery adopt the request at the top of page three of the meeting packet to temporarily suspend the bylaws to allow us to hold this virtual meeting by Zoom and approve our using the same procedures that we used in the May and June Presbytery meetings, which were also by Zoom. And these rules I wanna point out do comply with Robert's Rules of Order newly revised and with the Book of Order. Thank you, Mr. Stated Clerk. If you are in favor of this motion, do nothing. If you have an objection to this motion, vote no. Just a reminder, no one needs to vote yes. If you're in favor of the motion, you don't need to vote. If you're opposed to this unanimous consent request, you would vote no. Seeing no no votes, um, this motion is adopted by unanimous consent. Uh, moderator, I want to make sure since there are some who had were having difficulty of uh, finding the yes no buttons, is there anyone who who has not yet succeeded in making the yes no buttons work? who wishes to vote no, please unmute now and indicate, so indicate. So no voices are heard, moderator. Okay, it, then you may so, proceed. Thank you. I now ask unanimous consent to approve the revised docket for today's meeting, the report and motions submitted by the Committee on Preparation for ministry motions one, two, and three. If you agree with this motion, do nothing. If you have an objection to the motion, vote no. I'm not seeing any no votes. So this motion is carried by unanimous consent that we revise the docket to only include those matters presented by the Committee on Preparation of Ministry or Ministry. Moderator, I have just a couple more things to do. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware of any corresponding members who need to be seated today in this meeting, but I do have requests from four ministers to be excused. So I ask unanimous consent that they be granted excuses for today's meeting. You've heard the motion that the ministers of the word and sacrament be granted excuses for this meeting. If you are in favor of this motion, do nothing. If you disagree with the motion, vote no. Then the motion to excuse the four ministers of the word and sacrament is adopted by unanimous consent. Moderator, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. I now recognize Minister of the Word and Sacrament, Reverend Michael Isaacs, Chair of the Committee on Preparation for Ministry. And if he to come forward. <laughs> All right. I I will come forward. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. moderator. Uh, today marks the second time that we, uh, the CPM seeks to approve or transfer of a candidate from another denomination using the policy that we approved in February of 2019. The detailed rationale for why the committee is proposing today's motion can be found in the meeting packet. Um, and that includes the actions of the committee on ministry in support of these motions. Um, I think that's all I need to say about um, uh, those reasons, unless there are any questions from the body. Are there any questions of Reverend Isaacs about the rationale and background about the process that they use for and the reasoning that he's coming forward, the committee has come forward with these motions? Are there any questions, any discussion? 
Well, then I move that the Presbytery of the Miami Valley examine the Reverend Steve Schum, Stephen Schum, for transfer of ministerial membership and recognition of ordination to the Presbyterian Church USA, pursuant to G2.0505 and G2.0610 of the Book of Order and Section 1.09 of the CPM Policy and Practice. You have heard the motion, which is um, that the Presbytery examine the Reverend Stephen Schum for ordination and membership transfer to the Presbyterian Church USA based on his statements found in appendices A, B, and C. This motion does not need a second, and the chair is recognized to speak in support of the motion. The... Um... Working with Stephen for, uh, for the last um, s several, oh, am, am I asking the first question of the examination or am I speaking? I'm, not, I'm speaking at the start of the yet. motion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is um, the yeah, the, uh, the, the committee has worked with Stephen since the beginning of, of, of February 2019, even proceeding then. Um, and he has been um, uh, taking the process very seriously and faithfully and um, has been very diligent and we look forward to, to examining him on the floor um, of, of Presbytery and sharing the process we've, um, the insights we've learned from him over the past several years. Okay, thank you. I will now treat the motion as a unanim unanimous consent request um, to move forward with examination of the Reverend Stephen Schum on his three statements and his qualifications for ordination and membership transfer to the Presbyterian Church USA. I remind you that this is a vote to only examine Reverend Schum. Is there any objection to proceeding with the examination? If you are in favor of proceeding, do nothing. If you have an objection, vote no. Seeing no, no votes, we will now proceed. And I recognize um, Reverend Stephen Schum to present his statement of faith, which can be found in Appendix A. Reverend Schum. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, I gotta say, before I read this, I love how orderly this is done. It's one of the things I love about PCUSA. All right, uh, my statement of faith, uh, which you have in Appendix A, uh, reads as thus. Uh, I believe in God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the universe, revealed uh, in God's actions, known by God's Holy Spirit, and manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. Together in its holy dance, the three-in-one God loves and purposes to save the world God has made for God's own sake. God reveals these purposes through those whom God has elected for this task. Uh, Israel, apostles, disciples, the early church, teachers, preachers, and anyone who witnesses to the experience of God's love and grace. These experiences and this revealed knowledge are preserved through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in scripture, doctrine, and church tradition. The same spirit opens scripture to us as we read, interpret, and proclaim it through the ages. God is known by God's word, the scriptures God has inspired, the witness of those who name and proclaim their experience of the divine, and most fully in Jesus Christ, Son of God, and God made flesh. In Jesus Christ, the gospel, that is the good news of God's love and purposes of salvation, uh, are known and realized for all time. His birth and incarnation named God's love for the world and God's willingness to go to great lengths, even uh, to sacrifice for all creation. Jesus' ministry and teaching illuminates the law and the prophets, and Jesus' uh, death and resurrection fulfill them. The cross exposes our own sinfulness, and the resurrection testifies to God's ability and willingness to free us from the powers of sin and death. Uh, the fullness of the victory of this good news realized in Christ's death and resurrection is being manifest through time. The church exists to witness to the fullness of that gospel as it testifies to the vision 
and the hope of the realm of God, where illness, death, and sin exist no more, and life flourishes, peace and justice kiss, and judgment and grace no longer stand in opposition to one another. The church testifies to the way that God's reality is breaking into our time and place and already has transformed individuals, institutions, and creation. The church witnesses to the gospel, supporting and participating in God's work wherever God is bringing good news and life. The church exists to worship the God of life and to enjoy and proclaim God's good news. God's Holy Spirit creates and sustains the church as a sign and foretaste of the realm of God. God has promised to be present wherever people gather in Christ's name. God keeps this promise and gives God's presence and Holy Spirit to the Reformed Church as it gathers to worship and renew and refresh itself through the sacrament, uh, sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. In the fellowship of the church, we witness to God's grace and are shaped as disciples of Christ. The Christian life is characterized by a desire and striving to live uh, more and more according to the principles of the realm of God, uh, the character of Jesus Christ, and our individual giftedness and calling. We live into the promises and covenant of baptism in and through the power of God's Holy Spirit. In the church, we are shaped and formed for Christian living. We are encouraged and edified. We are supported and held accountable to be our own best selves, faithful in our relationships and our commitments, true to our giftedness and our calling uh, to God and to others. In Christ, uh, law and love together give shape to our lives. We confess our sin and keep our eyes fixed on the hope and vision of God's realm coming in fullness and already here. We thank God for the ways God has reformed us, even as we ask to be more fully reformed, that we might witness to God's perfect uh, vision of a good creation. We witness in particular to the ordered and reasoned ways that God has been present and made God's self known in and through the reformed tradition. We celebrate and embody that history and tradition, even as we open ourselves to God's presence, movement, and revelation outside our own story and experience. God's spirit of life speaks peace and good news in every corner of creation. Wherever death and the powers of sin hold sway, the gospel of Jesus Christ is contextual and takes whatever shape necessary to counter sin, brokenness, and death in its myriad forms. To the captive, the gospel is release. To the oppressed, it is justice. To the prideful, it is humbling. To the exhausted, it is rest. To the hungry and the poor, it is enough. To the fearful, it is peace. To the injured, it is healing and an end to violence. To those on a path of self-destruction, it is a rest and a new start. To the traumatized, it is healing and wholeness. To the lonely, it is belonging and relationship. To the disenfranchised, it is empowerment and a seat at the table. To the alienated, it is reconciliation. To the dying, it is hope for new life in Christ. For the grieving, it is comfort and hope for reunion. This I believe. All praise and glory to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Reverend Schoen. We will now proceed with the examination and the stated clerk will explain the process. I will, however, remind you that this um, examination is an essential part of the process. And therefore, the moderator will not recognize a motion to arrest the examination. Stated clerk, I recognize you. Thank you, moderator. Friends, by tradition during examinations like this, the Committee on Preparation for Ministry will ask the first question. And I understand that Ruling Elder Marge Montler will ask that question on behalf of the committee. I will be, um, I will be Marge Montler today, <laughs> and she is not with us. Okay, Michael, thank you. Then the Committee on Ministry, through Marge Morgan, their chair, will ask the second question. Following that, other presbyters will have the chance to ask questions. As we did in June, I will now make a list of people wishing to ask questions. I'm going to ask you to use your raise hand button on your device. Remember, we practiced that a little bit earlier. 
to say that you want to be in line to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So anyone who wants to ask a question, please now raise your hand on your device. Uh, and I will list you in order that I see them. Uh, I see Angie Skink. I see Herbie Miller. I see Frank Rupnik. I see Nancy Birdsong. I see Daria Schaffnit. I see Diana Cercelli. I'm just continuing to scroll down to see if I see any other hands. Uh, Elizabeth Davis. Now I need to ask, is there, are there any co-hosts who um, under Zoom don't have a chance to raise their hands who wish to ask a question or anyone who can't make their raise hand function work? So unmute yourself and say you'd like to raise a question. Okay, I don't hear any more voices, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep watching. I'm gonna, first of all, clear away all the blue hands now. Um, so I'll keep watching the participants list. If you wanna ask a question, just raise your hand during the questioning and I'll put you on the list at the end of the list. Um, and I wanna point out that here's the way we're gonna run the questioning. If you're recognized by the moderator to ask a question and Steve responds to that question and you have a follow-up that's directly related to your original question, like asking for more clarity from Steve about an answer, you can ask that question right away, that follow-up right away. But if you have a second, totally different question, please alert us and we will put you at the end of the list. You'll have a second question opportunity after everybody else has had a chance for at least one question. Is that clear? All right, so um, moderator, I just wanna go back through my list so everyone knows what order we're in and, and I'll help you through this if you would like. Marge, Mo I'm sorry, Michael Isaacs first, Marge Morgan second, then Angie Skank, Herbie Miller, Frank Rupnik, Nancy Birdsong, Daria Schaffnit, Diana Cercelli, and Elizabeth Davis in that order. Okay, thank you. We will now begin with um, Reverend Isaacs and the first question. Hello, Stephen. Uh, this question does come from Marge Motler. Uh, can you more fully share what you mean by the gospel of Jesus Christ being contextual and taking whatever necessary shape to counter sin? Yeah. And yeah. in the same section, how do you understand the gospel as a rest? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Marge, through Michael. <laughs> so uh, uh, when I talk about the gospel being contextual, I had, I had some of this conversation with CPM beforehand, and so this is uh, kind of a further elaboration uh, of that. Um, uh, I recognize that the gospel, there is, is a basic uh, uh, kind of cosmic objective sense of the gospel. Uh, there is the reconciliation that is accomplished through Christ uh, uh, for for all the world, uh, for us with God, uh, and that is sort of in a nutshell uh, what is often understood as the gospel, the good news. Uh, but then my sense also is that that good news is made uh, manifest through time in each of our lives uh, in different ways, and it probably uh, I, I probably go to the language of the Psalms, uh, uh, the psalmist who cries out to God. Uh, to save me from a, uh, a whole plethora of situations, uh, whether it is, in fact, uh, 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 save me from my enemies, save me from, from sickness and illness, 
Uh, it's that language from the psalmist and elsewhere in scripture uh, that makes me aware that the gospel uh, also has these, these facets in our lives. Uh, and those are the contexts where the, um, the good news of, uh, of Jesus Christ becomes real to us in real time here and now. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh, that's where I um, uh, go off on kind of that, that riff in my last paragraph about the, the various uh, ways that the gospel is made real. And, and the, uh, the context that I name are, are merely a, a sampling uh, of ones that I have known in, in my years of ministry. I know there are as many different uh, uh, situations and contexts as there are communities and people. Uh, Michael, remind me of the second half of Marge's question. It was, uh, uh, so to talk about the context and then what was the other piece? You're, you're muted, Mike. I know. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people wish they could do that to me. Um, what is, um, what do you mean by arrest? Oh yes, right. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, the language of, of arrest, uh, it, it is this idea, uh, I think the, uh, I talk about, it, for those who are on a path of self-destruction, uh, good news is arrest. And what I mean by that is being stopped in our tracks, uh, uh, being stopped in the behavior that is leading us uh, in death-dealing directions uh, and turned around. Uh, I told uh, CPM when I talked to them, that language comes from a particular professor who had an experience in his uh, earlier days of, of actually being arrested uh, because of some of his behavior and um, uh, how he looks back on that. He looked back on that then as good news because it, uh, it, it stopped him in the direction he was going, which was a bad direction. So that's, uh, uh, that's where uh, the language of arrest was very intentional, even if it may not have been uh, uh, obviously, generally obvious uh, in that uh, that context. Okay, thank you, Marge. I'm Marge Morgan, ruling elder from Sugar Creek Church in Dayton, and the chair of the committee on ministry. Steve, it's good to talk to you this morning. Good morning, Marge. Um, and Michael, there must be something about the name Marge because my question is will come out of that same piece too. And rather than change the question I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Wait, based on that same section, my question though is, what shape do you see the gospel taking in the ministry context of New Carlisle, Ohio, oh. in Clark County, Ohio, in the middle of a global pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the shape it takes now. So, so what I try to set up in that paragraph is that the gospel meets the needs, uh, uh, the, the very real needs that are in our lives. And so uh, um, I, I'm going to go, I think I'm going to name three things. Uh, 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 connection. Uh, um, well, maybe they can all be, be wrapped up under connection. Uh, I think... Uh, one of the things I'm aware of uh, in this context, and this is not different than uh, many of our contexts, is the polarization of our communities. And so I think uh, the gospel takes uh, uh, the form, well, it's, it's um, the language of Paul in Ephesians 2, right? Uh, uh, Jesus Christ breaking down the walls that divide us. Uh, uh, I... Um, would very readily recognize that the divisions, uh, political, uh, racial, uh, what have you, that exist in society, uh, are a, an impediment to ministry here, uh, as they are many places. And so um, that is one place I would hope that the gospel can, in fact, uh, 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 provide some um, uh, alternative, some reconciliation. Uh, I think connection then just with neighbors around us. Uh, we tend to be, we have a few folks in the neighborhood, uh, but most of our folks uh, are, are somewhat scattered. Uh, I think, especially in pandemic, um, uh, I would hope uh, to 
well, maybe this isn't going to happen in pandemic, but shortly after it, to connect with neighbors and see how they're doing, uh, uh, what are the needs that exist here, that we might, uh, uh, that the gospel, that we might respond out of kind of the good news that we've experienced to, uh, to respond to those. Um, hmm. All right, I started saying I have three things. Now I've forgotten what the third one is, so I'll leave it at the two. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, now I think we go to Angie Schneck. Good morning. Good morning. I would um, I would just like to ask uh, Stephen, uh, are there particular um, co uh, confessions within the book of confession that you find speaking to you more strongly during this particular yeah, time yeah. in history and and why? Yeah. If I could uh, remind so, people to, Steve, if you could hold for just a second, remind people to introduce themselves oh, sorry. When, they're, when they're given the authority to speak. Thank you. Okay. Angie Scape, I'm serving as stated supply at Slifer's Presbyterian Church in Farmersville. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so thank you, Angie. And, and um, uh, uh, the ones, the confessions that, that I find myself uh, drawn to uh, uh, right now uh, are, are Barman and Belhar. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this sermon on Sunday is drawing from, from Barman and its, its context. Um, I, I think um, the, the, the why question is a little more complicated. So, so I'm gonna pause. I, I think Barman, I've always been drawn to Barman uh, as a, um, it, because of the pause it gives us to examine our relationship uh, with the powers, uh, uh, whatever the dominant uh, uh, power of society is. Uh, and, and I come as a, uh, a young man who grew up for the most part in Canada to the US. And um, I find that that, that gives me a, a, a an outside perspective where I'm, I'm naturally doing that. Uh, and, but I like that, that, that confession and that, um, uh, invitation, uh, requirement, uh, is built into our confessions that we don't, uh, that, that we, we, we take time to consider our relationship to power, uh, and consider that, there may be times when our faith and our covenant with God calls us to uh, uh, to speak uh, um, a, a challenge to power at times. So that's that's Barman. I the the Belhar confession. Um, I appreciate again because of the context that comes out of, and the uh, what I would call trouble that exists. Uh, in our society and in our nation with, with racial tensions that exist. Uh, um, the call to uh, uh, reconciliation, uh, uh, to wrestle with what that means. Uh, here at Honey Creek, we just used a, a section of the Belhar Confession as our affirmation of faith uh, this past Sunday. Uh, I, I like that it talks about unity uh, as a, a both a right and a, a, a responsibility of the church, something that we need to take uh, uh, with integrity. Uh, and I think this is a time when we are again struggling with what does that look like and what does it mean to be faithful um, in uh, a nation that is again uh, wrestling with its uh, uh, racial legacy. So, yeah. I think that's how I would respond, uh, Angie, to your question. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to Herbie Miller. Hey, um, Herbie Miller, uh, teaching elder, Corinth Presbyterian Church. Steve, great to see you yep. morning, here Herbie. in this uh, meeting today. Good morning. Uh, my question for you comes from Appendix C on page nine, the very last sentence of your motivation and expectations. Yeah. Um, you said you were pleasantly surprised to find expressions within the Presbyterian Church that closely paralleled the Anabaptist vision of pacifism, community, and discipleship. And I am hoping that uh, you could maybe elaborate on that. And my question is, 
what sources in the Reformed Confessions helped you conclude that pacifists could find a theological home in the Presbyterian Church? Hmm. Uh, I don't know that it's, I'm trying to think if, if it's in uh, the Confessions where I find that, or if it's in uh, um, the, the conversations. I think I was first, let me first address why I was surprised. I think we grow up all in our own silos, right? And we think, uh, 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 what we have received, our tradition is is kind of unique and separate. Uh, um, uh, when I when we first uh, when I was in seminary at Princeton, uh, which was my first real engagement with uh, uh, Reformed theology uh, and with Presbyterians, uh, I gravitated toward those uh, uh, who who would advocate for peace uh, um, and. Uh, I think I was surprised that there were Presbyterians who believed that because, of course, I think the uh, the, the picture we get of other traditions uh, uh, sometimes tends to be uh, 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 a stereotype, almost a caricature. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I think I presumed uh, that all Presbyterians were uh, uh, just war defendants. Uh, and certainly we had our dose of those. I had a, a, a wonderful and challenging class with Max Stackhouse uh, in, uh, in seminary. Max would have been a, a uh, although I don't think he's Presbyterian, but he would have been a, a staunch uh, um, Niberian uh, realist who would argue for uh, the place and role of, uh, uh, of violence and military as a restraint. Um, I, I think I was pleasantly surprised to find uh, uh, folks who spoke about um, God's desire for peace in the Presbyterian Church because it resonated. Um, I, I think I'm very much aware. I was thinking about this uh, uh, last night and, and thinking about this meeting. The way I hold my sense of pacifism is different in this context. Uh, than it was in uh, uh, in a Mennonite church. Uh, I, I think it's a difference of degree rather than uh, um, uh, in character. Uh, in the Mennonite church, there would be folks who say pacif pacifism means uh, complete non-resistance. You can't raise a hand, do anything to defend yourself. You rely solely on God and God's ability uh, to fight for you, to act on your behalf. Um, that is not where I am in this context. Uh, yeah, so uh, context shapes the way that I hold that, that sense of, uh, of pacifism. And it really is, I think, uh, more so uh, in conversation with folks in the Presbyterian Church. It's being heartened by uh, uh, the peace witness uh, that exists within the Presbyterian Church. You make me realize, Herbie, that what I need to do is go back through the confessions and and uh, and see where that is, uh, because I haven't done that, and so I don't know that I can uh, readily at this point point to uh, to that. I have appreciated, like I said, conversations uh, uh, with folks uh, when I was at Southminster. I appreciated uh, in Nancy Birdsong, a another uh, pacifist uh, uh, advocate. Um, so. I think that's the best I can do in answering your question, Herbie. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And now we got a Frank. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Yes, I'm Frank Rubnick, the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Troy. I'm going to switch a little bit away from theology and the confessions into more of a kind of a, a practical sort of question. But what do you see as the biggest strengths of the Presbyterian Church USA as you're transitioning into it? But then also, what do you view as the biggest area of opportunity for growth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Frank, for your question. All right. So I'm going to name stability as uh, um, perhaps the answer to both uh, questions. Uh, uh, 
the stability of, uh, of PCUSA, the, the long history, um, the, uh, the sense of knowing yourselves as a denomination. I've, I've often said, I like the explicit nature of the Presbyterian Church, which, which I think grows out of the, a theology of the word. Uh, if there is uh, a sense, if there's a question, what do Presbyterians believe? Or what, or what is their polity even more so? Uh, this is true both of, of doctrine and even more so of polity. If there's a question of how something should be done or what is believed, it's probably been written on somewhere, uh, either officially or, or unofficially. Uh, and I like that you can go and find that and look it up and you can see what it is. Uh, there is a stability that comes with that, both with the long history uh, and also the careful articulation uh, of who, uh, who we are as a denomination, who PCUSA, PCUSA is uh, as a denomination. That, that stability, uh, I think, reflects the um, steadfast faithfulness of God to the denomination. Now, the challenge, I think, then, is in um, adaptability and turning this great ship around uh, and being able to respond to shifts and changes uh, in culture. Uh, there is a um, there is a strength that comes with not sort of chasing after every shiny new thing, every new sort of worship movement, every new uh, uh, kind of church planting uh, impulse. Um, there is a, a, a strength and a stability comes from that, but there's also then, uh, we're a little slow sometimes to, to react to changes that are happening. Uh, and I think right now, uh, uh, I think culture is undergoing one of those great shifts uh, and how are, how is PCUSA going to shift and adapt and change to respond to that uh, when and where God is calling us to do so? Um, yeah. Does that answer your question, Frank? Okay. All right. Then we'll move on to Nancy Bird's song. Okay. Well, hi, Steve. Morning, um, Nancy. When I worked with um, Nancy Birdsong, pastor head of staff at Southminster Presbyterian Church. Um, Steve, when we worked together, when you were in NRM here, I certainly felt well blessed and the congregation did by your ministry. And to me, one of the gifts that enhanced your ability as a pastor was your background in the Mennonite church. And, and bringing that into the Presbyterian church, I just saw, um, great potential for the future um, to, to have you around and, and to have those influences as well. Can you tell me anywhere where you see that, where you see that background in the Mennonite church enhancing your ministry now? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Nancy. I find, um, so it, I think I, I talked a little bit about uh, there being similarities um, between uh, Mennonite Church and PCUSA. Uh, you all don't know this, but for Mennonite polity, most Mennonite polity has been cribbed from, from Presbyterian polity. Uh, so uh, uh, it doesn't all feel that foreign to me. I think one of the, um, one of the things that I was steeped in, that I come by naturally uh, from the Mennonite tradition, there's a strong, uh, anti-clerical uh, emphasis in the Mennonite tradition uh, going back to, to the Radical Reformation and its history. So there's a suspicion of, of most leadership, uh, certainly formalized uh, leadership. And so what I, what I was steeped in is sort of a need to build, uh, um, to build on the gifts of the laity and the congregation, uh, because that's where uh, the locus of um, uh, of authority really is uh, the the uh, the pastor in a Mennonite congregation is really a servant to all. Uh, in some ways, the pastor is the lowest of everyone because everyone can uh, 
I'm actually, uh, there was uh, someone in a Mennonite context that, that uh, we were in who, who actually told the pastor, well, anyone can do what you do. <laughs> You're just, uh, uh, you just happen to have, have uh, been set aside for this. Now, what I love about PCUSA is that that's not the case. There is a respect and a, an honoring of the ministry, the ordered ministry, uh, both, both teaching and ruling uh, elders, uh, minister of word and sacrament. Uh, but I think that that development of gifts within uh, the congregation and the laity, I don't think that it is a, that, that is opposed to uh, PCUSA polity. In fact, I think it's built in there with the, the role of ruling elder and the importance of the session uh, as the uh, the decision-making body, the local authority. Uh, uh, but I, I think that that sense of, um, of drawing out the gifts that exist within the body, uh, I, I think that's always helpful uh, in ministry. And I found that to be, uh, to be helpful in these contexts as well. The other thing that I found helpful is just being able to, to ask in congregations, all right, why do you do it this way? <laughs> I, I've been able to use uh, the fact that I am someone coming from the outside as a way to ask that, uh, even if I know the answer, because it gets at those important questions of, of, of why. Uh, what is our purpose? Why do we do things uh, the way we do? And it helps uh, continuing a conversation of, of who we are and why we do things the way we do. That's my rambling response to your question. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We move on to Daria, Reverend. Yeah, Daria? Daria. 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 Hi, Steve. I'm Daria Schaffner. I'm the pastor at First Presbyterian in Yellow Springs. Morning. And uh, my question is about um, healthy leadership. It's really important, I think, for healthy congregations to have healthy leaders, and that means good self-care. Yeah. So could you please tell us what your self-care rituals yeah. or your plan for self-care or whatever are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Daria. That's a great question. Uh, 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 for me, self-care uh, probably involves real good boundaries, uh, and, and that's because I know myself uh, that I, if I am not cognizant and aware of having good boundaries, uh, I don't naturally put those in place. And so um, uh, I need those. I need to know that when I am, um, when I'm at work and when I'm called upon, then I am available. But I also uh, need to be able to set the church aside for a time. Uh, uh, both uh, a time through each week and also a time through uh, through the year. Um, so that uh, uh, that is a uh, for me a starting point around self care. I think the other thing for me is just knowing what it is uh, that feeds me and fuels me. And and um, as an introvert, it means finding time to, to be by myself, uh, to be out in nature, to be able to do a little reading. Um, so I know that the challenge is uh, to build structures of accountability in my life uh, that make sure that I get that. Because <laughs> I know I'm not always good making myself do it, but if I have someone else who is going to make me do it, who's going to ask me, did you, did you take your time off? Uh, uh, this quarter, this, this year, um, uh, I, and I've had in all my churches, I've had people who've done that, uh, and I appreciate that. Yeah. That's good. Thanks, Daria. Thank you. And we go on to Diana Roselli. Hi, Diana Cercelli at First Presbyterian Church, a teaching elder in Sydney. Um, I know I don't look like myself. I uh, This is the time for yep, poison, poison ivy. ivy. Yep. Sorry, poison ivy. 
no accident. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to tell you, Steve, that um, you've answered my question already uh, about differences in the Mennonite Church and the PCUSA. And uh, so thank you. I don't have any more questions, but I tell you, it is such a pleasure serving under your excellent leadership in the Network Support and Grants Committee. Wow. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, I, um, I will answer. It's not a question that you asked, but I'm going to answer it anyway. It, it has to do again. Maybe it allows me to further elaborate on what I was saying uh, with Herbie's question about the differences between the two. One of the things Part of this process is I have to renounce my ordination or my credentials in, in Mennonite Church USA. And for a while, that term renunciation of credentials has kind of stuck in my craw. So I've given thought about it. Um, I mean, one of the, the differences in practice is something uh, like uh, baptism. I think I, 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 I talk about this somewhere in my written materials. Um, in some ways, it seems uh, strange to to renounce credentials. In other ways, I feel like I've already done that as I've been serving. Because uh, as soon as I started as a ministering member from a corresponding denomination, as soon as I started serving in, in the, the presbytery here, I knew, okay, I'm playing by PCUSA rules now. I'm not playing by Mennonite rules. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, I've already been doing some of that, that renunciation. Um, there are there are no differences that are so big that they keep me from being excited about being at this moment. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, I appreciate more the similarities. Uh, don't, I don't gloss over the differences, but they are, they are not so large that God is not, uh, doesn't hold them together. Thank you, Diana. Thank, thank you. Now, um, Elizabeth Davis. Morning, Elizabeth. Let's see, Elizabeth. There we go. Hello. Uh, Just had to unmute myself and bring down yes. my microphone. I am Elizabeth Davis. I am a ruling elder of Southminster Presbyterian Church. And also, hi, Steve. Morning. Morning. Good to hear so, from you. Hey, I made sure to be here at this meeting when I saw you're on the docket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But my question is, is that I know part, according to you, in Appendix C, your um, reason for transferring, that part of the issues that came forth was a lack of opportunity for a men, for a Mennonite ministry in this area. My question is, is whether um, do you continue to stay, do you the continue to plan to stay at the Presbyterian Church yeah. if you should move to another area with more opportunities for Mennonite ministry? Yeah. Uh, uh... That is a good question, Elizabeth. And and uh, uh, I suppose the short answer is is yes. I plan to continue uh, seeking ministry opportunities in PCUSA. Um, some of the reason it's taken me a while to move through this process, and some of uh, the dragging of my feet, perhaps I think, is a uh, a desire to make sure this is what God is calling me to here. Um, some of the, 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 where I talk about um, my winding up here with you all in the Miami Presbytery, uh, some of it is um, circumstantial. Uh, that is a, an explanation of how I wind up here. It is not an explanation of why I'm excited to be here or, or excited to continue uh, with uh, PCUSA. Um, apparently I just ran out of gas because I don't know what else <laughs> I was gonna say. Uh, yeah, it, one, of, one of, we, as far as we know, we are here in the Miami Valley for uh, an indeterminate future. Uh, but if we would, uh, if God would call, uh, call me, my wife, our family somewhere else, um, the first thing I would do is look for opportunities to minister in Peace USA. I'm throwing my lot with you all, uh, and I'm a loyal individual, so you are going to be stuck with me. Does that answer your question, Elizabeth? Yes. 
All right, thank Glad you. Glad to have you on board. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the state clerk if he sees other names who wish to speak or there are others who wish to speak. I have been watching moderator and I've not seen anyone else raise their hand, um, but perhaps we should give an opportunity for someone to unmute and request that opportunity now. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? Seeing none, I declare the discussion closed. And Reverend Schum, I'm going yep. to ask that you leave us for a moment and we'll bring you back out of the waiting room when we're ready for you. I would be glad to. I think someone needs to put me in the waiting room. I don't think I can go there myself, can I? No, Terry is going to put you in. Okay. Okay. All right, great. All right. Um, you have heard the examination and responses from Reverend Schum. I call upon um, Reverend Isaac for uh, motion two. Yeah. On behalf of the committee, I present motion two that the Presbytery of the Miami Valley approve the transfer of ministerial membership and recognition of ordination of the Reverend Stephen Schum uh, from the Mennonite Church to the Presbyterian Church USA. Okay, thank you. You've heard the motion, which is that the Presbytery of the Miami Valley approved the transfer of the ordination and membership of the Reverend Stephen Schum from the Mennonite Church USA to the Presbyterian Church USA. Is there any discussion? Does anybody desire to say anything? And for this, I suggest you unmute and request rather than doing their hand raising. Mar Madam moderator. Yes. Uh, Marge Morgan, COM chair, on behalf of the Committee on Ministry, we wholeheartedly endorse this transfer. Stephen has done wonderful ministry in three of our churches now, and we are um, very excited to have him transfer his credentials to us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam moderator. Yes. This, this is Gretchen Cleese from Southminster Presbyterian. Okay. And having, having, having worked with Stephen uh, somewhat closely, since I also work in the office as a volunteer, I wholeheartedly agree with what Marge said. Thank you. Thank you. Madam moderator. Yes. This is Casey Hines. I am the transitional pastor at Urbana Presbyterian Church and um, one of the churches that he served within our presbytery. And I have to say that they continue to praise the good work that he did while he was there. So I am excited about welcoming him, him to our presbytery as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Um, Herbie? Yeah, Herbie Miller, Corinth Presbyterian Church teaching elder. As somebody who went through the process last year that Steve is going through today, um, I know the experience of having to sur sort of uh, analyze your theological upbringing and what that's like to consider what the PCUSA is and the reform tradition more broadly is and how you fit into that. And after hearing Steve talk about um, his theological background, his ecclesial background and where he is today and his commitments to the PCUSA, um, I'm satisfied with the uh, self-reflection that he's done, and I'm confident that Steve will add a constructive theological witness to the Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Anyone else? I just wanted to add, he didn't completely answer all I wanted him to say in that question, because maybe he doesn't know this about himself, but his Mennonite background makes him a non-anxious presence in the church and someone who, if he's in the middle of a few people that are not being so non-anxious with each other, he, he is just wonderful at helping people to listen to each other, at listening to people in the congregation, in fostering peace and unity in churches. And, and that is quite a gift that every one of our churches could use. So I just, that was something he didn't share about himself, but I would say is one of the gifts that he brings with him to the PCUSA. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Okay, you, you have made um, some really important statements about him. And now I think the discussion has ended and it is time to vote. So I remind you that we need three fourths of you in favor of this motion. So we're going to have to do yes and no's on this one. All in favor of this transfer and ordination of membership of Reverend Stephen Schoon, would you please vote yes. Those who oppose, please vote no. <clears throat> Moderator, I'm, I'm looking carefully at the list here because I don't want anyone to be disabled from voting. It's a little hard for me to see. I see there are a couple of people who have not yet voted, who are commissioners who are eligible to vote. Um, and the way, <laughs> okay, William Cash has a thumbs up, which we will interpret as a yes. <laughs> um, so make that 50. 52. 52. Okay. We still, we have, we're still down maybe one or two participants. Is there anyone who has not been able to make their yes or no button work and not able to vote? Merritt Worthen, State of Supply, College Hill. I have no yes or no but button, so I've been, been doing the thumbs up as well. Okay, so that's two thumbs up that would be yeses. 50. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I would say the vote is unanimous. Well, the, the vote, yes, it is. And as I'm counting it, moderator, it's 53 yes and zero no's. Right. <clears throat> okay, therefore we have a three fourths vote um, and I declare this motion adopted. Now, I call upon Reverend Isaacs again for motion three. Moderator, I present motion three, that the presbytery having approved a motion to authorize the stated clerk to enter the Reverend Shum on the rolls of this presbytery as a minister of word and sacrament upon receiving evidence of his membership in any other Christian church have been has been surrendered. You've heard motion three. I will not repeat that one. Is there any discussion? If there is an objection to that motion, please vote no. Otherwise, if you agree with the motion, do nothing. Okay, seeing no, no votes. Um, this, emotion, this motion is adopted. Okay, now, um, Terry, it is time to um, invite Reverend Shum back in. And when he comes back in, I would like for each of you to unmute yourselves and just give him a round of applause, okay? He's back. Okay. Yay! Hey, blessings. Oh. Welcome, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome, Steve. Yay. Thank you. I, I suppose that means the, the vote was in the affirmative then. I'll let you know. <laughs> Just hold on. All right, all right. <laughs> hold on. Just hold on. Yes, that means the vote was unanimous. There were oh. three yeses and no noes. <laughs> so it is my joyful duty to announce that um, that motion is granted and your ordinance <laughs> transferred to the Presbyterian Church USA will be approved um, when we get all of the other information from you. But right now we have something very important to do. Um, I have got to um, ask you the constitutional questions that yes. all ministers <laughs> of um, the sacrament 
um, the word and sacrament are asked upon uh, ordination and installation. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everybody, well, let's just mute them um, host, okay. <clears throat> Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit? Do you? Uh, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I certainly do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? With God's help, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will I you? I will. Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, Subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit, will you? Yes, I enthusiastically will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will with God's help. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? I will. Will you be a faithful minister of the word and sacrament, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. Well, now I say congratulations, and we're going to pray. Thank you. All right. Um, well, not yet. Congratulations. And now that the Presbytery has approved your transfer and you have successfully answered the constitutional questions, you will now officially become um, Minister of the Word and Sacrament and a member of the Presbytery of the Miami Valley in that capacity as soon as we have received all the paperwork indicating that your minister membership and other faith traditions has ended. We are honored and delighted to have you among us as a colleague in the Presbyterian faith. Mm -hmm. We welcome your, your saying a few words at this time, if you would like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am giddy and excited. I didn't think it would feel this momentous and, uh, uh, this good to be uh, uh, received by you all. Um, so thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I want to I want to say a few thank yous. Thank you to the Presbytery. Uh, thank you to you all for your openness to consider this. Um, uh, Herbie, you and I started this process together a number of years ago, and one of the things CPM asked us to do was to take an online polity course, and it was done by. Uh, in another presbytery by a stated clerk who I think uh, had done his job for 30 plus years and was a polity wonk, uh, probably not as good as our polity wonk, but he was pretty good. Uh, but in one of the discussions with that class, I don't think he knew what context we were coming from. He, he talked about, uh, there's a section in the, the book of order that talks about transferring ministerial credentials. And, and he, he presented this as, as something that was in the Book of Order, but that never happened. He said it certainly wouldn't happen uh, in our presbytery. Maybe he didn't say certainly. <laughs> he just strongly thought. And at the time, I thought, oh, I'm glad I'm in the Miami Valley and not uh, not there. So first of all, just thank you all for, uh, for being willing to receive uh, some of us from different flocks. I appreciate that. Um, 
thank you to early connections. I uh, Sometimes I describe myself as a turtle. I did not move through this process quickly, um, but I am grateful for those uh, five, six years ago when I began uh, relating to this presbytery. Thanks to uh, uh, Brian McGuire, who connected me uh, with Dennis Piermont early on, executive presbyter at the time, uh, who facilitated conversations uh, with congregations here uh, and, and opened a door to allow me to serve in um, transitional ministry as a ministry member uh, of a corresponding denomination. Uh, I want to thank uh, the folks at First Presbyterian Church of Urbana uh, who allowed me to cut my reformed teeth with them. Um, I learned a lot uh, from them uh, and am grateful for, for their openness and their warmth, uh, which made me feel welcome. Um, I don't think they always knew up at Urbana what to do with the pastor who was always asking, why do you do this that way? Or, or what's that all about? Um, but <laughs> I appreciate their willingness to work with me. Uh, thanks then also to, of course, Southminster Presbyterian Church, uh, to Nancy and everyone there for allowing me uh, to serve with them and further my understanding of all things uh, Peace USA and Reformed. Um, thanks to the Presbytery for opportunities to serve on committees and get to know many of you uh, as colleagues working together in ministry uh, and getting to see uh, uh, the work of the Presbytery in those committees. Uh, as I look across the various faces on this Zoom meeting, I'm heartened by the many familiar faces I have already learned to know and I look forward to getting to know uh, many of the rest of you. A uh, special thank you to the Presbytery staff, uh, to Larry Holler, who has kept me on the Presbytery straight and narrow from time to time. But also, Larry, I want to say thank you uh, to you and Karen. You and Karen invited Joni and I over for dinner very early on in our process. Uh, and I remember at the time feeling like, okay, Maybe there is a place for, for us, for me here. And so I want to say thank you for your hospitality and, and your welcome for that. Um, you may not know the effect that had, but, but I remember it fondly. And then thank you uh, as well to Terry Cuckoo for continuing to be an encouraging presence. Uh, to Tom Oxley for doing everything he does there uh, in the office. Um, it feels good. It feels good to be a part of you all. So thank you. Thank you. And let us just um, say a special little prayer for you. Um, let us pray. God of the universe, you give us all special gifts to use in the building of your kingdom. We thank you for sending Reverend Shum to the Presbytery of the Miami Valley with all of the gifts that you have given him. We ask that you bless him with strength, wisdom, and compassion as he carries on his work in our presbytery. And that with that work, he is showing that he appreciates the calling that you have placed on him to spread the good news of the gospel in this presbytery. We thank you, amen. Now, um, friends, Basically, the business of this meeting has been completed. It's been a joyous occasion today. And um, our next stated meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, September 8th at three o'clock at the Presbyterian Church of Hamilton. Soon, the Leadership Committee um, Council will be meeting to determine whether or not this meeting will be an actual in-person meeting or a Zoom meeting as yeah. it looks like Moderator, that meeting has been decided to be by Zoom. Oh, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're debating about the November meeting, but the September meeting definitely is by Zoom. Okay. All right. So we'll be Zooming again in um, September, and we'll see what November holds. And <clears throat> as we leave this meeting today, go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>